Welcome to the Effortless Swimming Podcast. My guest today is a very well-known coach and author, Joe Frill. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Brenton. Glad to be here. Uh, I got introduced to you uh, by Mark Evans, who was on the podcast quite recently. And I've known about you for a long time, heard your your name around the triathlon circles because you've been around for a long time and I think a key figure in endurance training with the books that you've written and the knowledge that you've you've shared. So it's great to have you on the podcast to talk about some of these things and and specifically for the swimming side of triathlon. And before we got on this podcast, we were talking about yeah, what what do you think would be probably the most relevant thing for triathletes listening? And you said something that you've worked on with triathletes when you've been face to face is the skills, is the swimming skills. And I love to hear that because that is what we specialize in. We I love to work on technique and skills with athletes because there's just so much to gain no matter what age they're at and I had a camp last weekend up in Queensland and had an athlete uh, in his late 70s come along and over the past 12 to 18 months I've been working with him on his technique he'd never done any filming or analysis before and even in his late 70s he's he's still looking for improvement and I love to see that and I know you've done a lot of work with people as they they get older uh, to help improve their the VO2 max and their endurance, uh, but also skills is a huge one for swimming because no matter what your age, you can you can get better at it and see improvement. And unlike the VO2 max, which will which will drop off uh, for people as they age, skills you can improve over a lifetime. So with that with that in mind, what what sort of things were you looking at when you're working with people in person in terms of the the swimming skills? What sort of things do you see stand out? Yeah. Um, well, as as we talked, chatted brief, very briefly about at the start of this, uh, our conversation this morning. Um, you know what I what I found with with triathletes especially is that if they started swimming when they were six years old, seven years old, they have no problems whatsoever. They've got it figured out. But unfortunately, at least in the U.S., most triathletes come into the sport when they're in their thirties, forties, fifties. And they have absolutely no idea how to swim other than what they did when they were kids playing around the pool. And so, but they come from a sport like, like usually running or perhaps cycling. And so they think the way they're supposed to become better swimmers is doing the same things they did in those sports, which is basically doing intervals all the time. And that's going to make them faster, but it doesn't work. You really can't do it that way. Swimming is a, an entirely different animal compared to running and cycling. Water is a very thick medium to try to move your body through compared with air. Air is very easy to move your body through, although it's got some resistance. Water has got, um, I don't know what the, what the number is, but hundreds of times more resistance than air has when you're trying to move your body through it. And so it doesn't really matter how many intervals you do. All you're doing, if, if you've got poor technique, poor skills, is you're just creating a lot of bubbles around yourself as you go through the water. You're really not doing anything to make yourself faster. So uh, when I put on camps for athletes, the things I think that what we've always done is, so they're usually one week camps, is we start off the very first day with a 500 meter swim time trial, just to find out where they are. So we've got a baseline and they came into that day fresh because I, I told them before they come to the camp, it's gonna be a week long. They're gonna put in probably 20 hours or more of training which almost none of them have ever done. And so they need to get rested up before they come to the camp. So they come to come to us fresh. And on day one, they do a 500 meter time trial. And we record those, those, those numbers for, for posterity so we know what's going on in the future. And then for the coming week, for the next five days, all I do with them is work on skills. We never do a single interval. We never swim more than, than a 25 at one time, all they're doing is swimming to 25, working on a skill and stopping at the end of the 25. At the end of the, at the end of that 25, we talk about, I talk with them about what I saw, what they need to be working on individually. Then they swim the next 25. And I talk to them again about what they need to be working on individually. And there's four things I work on with, I won't go into those right now, but we, but we record them um, throughout the session. So every day we record every athlete and then every day we go over every athlete's technique on that video so they can see see themselves because most athletes don't really they think they're doing things right but they don't they don't really realize what's going on so we've got an underwater camera taking a look at them and and we can see what it is and i can point out these things and tell them how to correct this 
and we boil it down to four things. So I'll go into those four things now if you want me to, or we can save yeah. that for later, however you want to do it. That'd be good. Let's go into those four things. Okay. Uh, I, I started working on this many years ago uh, because I realized working with that with swimmers was not really going very well with just trying to get them be, to be better. And they were given so much information, so many ideas on how they could improve their swimming. And the ideas just didn't work. You know, there's all kinds of things out there about what, what should an athlete be doing to swim faster. For example, a very common thing that I run into talking to athletes is they have a coach that tells them to have their fingers close in the, in the pool or have them open in the pool. They get both, both instructions. <laughs> and I would say that's like a, that's like a two percenter. You know, you may get 2% better if you figure out which of those things you're supposed to do. It may make you 2% better. And there's other things that they do that are really uh, detrimental to the performance. And so what I'm trying to find is things that are more like 80 percenters. Mm. If they can make this change, they can get an 80% change in their in their speed in, in, the, in the pool. And so I've narrowed it down to four things. And what I so these are the four things I work with, and we have to work with them in a in a in a in a procedure in a process over time. I found so every day when I have these these athletes in the camp, every day I introduce one more of those four things to them. The very first day we work on what I call posture. It's easy, but you got to do it. And it's amazing how swimmers who start late in life have terrible posture in the pool. It doesn't matter what you do as far as everything else you're doing. If your posture is poor, you're never going to be a good swimmer. They always have this situation where they're swimming with their, their tails down. You know, their, their buttocks are below the surface of the water and their heads are up. They're like in this position in the water, not exaggerating it. It's much less, much less uh, extreme than that. But they're nevertheless, their butt is way below the surface of the water and their head is breaking the surface of the water. That's called posture. And so I'm, I work on one thing with them on that because they're all doing the same thing. They're all looking at the wall that they're swimming toward. So they've got their heads up. They've got their heads up in this position so they can see where that wall is and they're swimming at it like this with their heads. That, that causes their hips to go down. So we work on getting their nose pointed toward the bottom of the pool. That's the first step. And as soon as they get their nose pointed down, their hips come up. It's the first thing that happens. The hips come up close to the top of the water. So now the key is how can they watch where they're going? So I teach them something that I also teach them on the bike when they're doing a triathlon or a time trial. What you should do on the bike is you should keep your head down. But every few seconds, you bring your head up to look to see what's coming up. So you put your head down, bring it up. Put your head down, bring it up. In the pool, you don't even have to do that. All you do is put your head down, point your nose down, and roll your eyes up so you're looking through the tops of your goggles. So my eyes are looking up here, but my nose is pointing down there. Instead of bringing your head up in this position where you've got your eyes now in the middle of your goggles, you want your eyes at the top of your goggles. So we do all kinds of drills just to get, this and get them to understand how to do this and then we th start throwing in things like, okay, we've got to be able to, to sight when you're in open water swimming. So when you sight in the open water, you've got to bring your head up out of the water to see what, what, what your, what your uh, landmarks are that you're using to, to make sure you're swimming in a straight line. So we'll work on drills for doing that, how we go from being a nose down position to bringing your head up above water, how you do that, and then get back down into the into the aero or the dynamic uh, water dynamic position again. So that's the first thing we do on the first day. We spend about a half hour just working on that until everybody's got it. Everybody's got to figure this out, and we video record each athlete and show them where their head is, so they know where it's at. Have you found that's easy? Have you found yeah. that the video will uh, people think they're looking down? But they, you show them on the video and they go, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm actually looking directly forwards. I thought I was looking down like it. And it's such a, a simple thing with the head position and it's an easy one to, to change. But even just with that alone, the perception is just so far off with, with a lot of swimmers, uh, which I've, I've found quite interesting doing a lot of, of video work as well, where they think they're looking down, but they're, they're just not when you actually look at the video. I agree. Yeah, that, that's that's why we do the video so they can see themselves doing the things that we're talking about or not doing those things. 
Mm. And so the video becomes this feedback for them. And we show them the video before they even get out of the pool. We, we shoot the video. And while they're still in the pool, we show them on the mini screen for the camera we've got. We show them what they're doing so they can see it right now, real time. So we don't wait 24 hours to show them. We show them right now immediately. So they can go right back to, into the water again and work on it again. Shoot the video again. Show them again. Shoot the video again. Show them again. The idea is they've got to get some feedback from someplace. And swimming is a strange sport because you really can't tell what the rest, what, what, what your body is doing mm. because of the water and the position your body is in. It's not like running where you can look down at your feet and see what they're doing. You really can't look around while you're in, when you're in the pool. You've got to trust yourself to be doing the things the right way. So I agree. That's that's a that's a challenge, and we really have to work on that with all the athletes. So that's mm. day one in the camp. Day two, we go to the second thing. These I, I call these four things. P, D, L, C. P was posture. D is direction. Direction has to do with where their, where their lead arm is pointing when they reach out. So what is all too common is they reach across their face. So if I can demonstrate that here, they reach in this way. Their arm crosses in front of their face or maybe right in front of their face, but they think it's right in front of their shoulder. That's what they think is going on. But it's not. It's over here someplace. And so there's all these drills we do to, to help them learn how to do that the correct way. The most common drill I do with them is something I call uh, penguin stroke, penguin, penguin swimming. Penguins swim with these little bitty wings out to the sides. They never cross their wings in front of their face. Their wings always stay to the side. So we start off doing a drill where that, what I tell them what to do is I want you to swim and I want you to... Uh, Put your hand outside your shoulder when you make entry into the water. Outside the shoulder. And it takes it's amazing how long it takes them to figure that out. Especially the ones who have been crossing over, had their hands in front of their faces, or even worse, across their body. They think when they've got it in front of the shoulder that it's beyond the outside of their shoulder. They think it's wide. That's right where it's supposed to be, right in front of your shoulder. So we show them that video and they learn real quickly when I when it feels like it's wide, when it's too wide, it's actually just right. So what I tell them is from now on, all I want you to do is a is the penguin drill whenever you swim. You're always doing the penguin drill. So never think about what you used to do. Think about swimming like a penguin. And there's other drills we do too. I do a drill. Well, there's a whole bunch of things we do, but the idea is we're, we're teaching a skill. And they do that, we do that drill for about a, a, those drills for about a half hour, video recording every athlete, head-on recording underwater so they can see where their hands are going. And we do it over and over and over until they get it right. One thing I left out here is we, what we do is, is on before we even get in the water to do that drill, I have them stand on the deck with a partner. So they stand facing their partner. They bend over at the waist as if they're in a swimming position, head, nose pointing down. And they reach out in front of themselves with their hand and put it where they think it should be to be in front of their shoulder. And then their partner who is with them corrects, takes the hand and puts it where it's supposed to be. Then we do it again, put the hand in front of the shoulder and they put it back again in front of their face. The partner takes their hand and moves it back in front of their shoulder. We do this over and over and over until they feel on, on deck what it feels like to have your hand in front of your shoulder. Then we get in the water and we do the drill, the penguin drill. And so, and we record them so they can see it again in that, re, in that regard too. So we do that. That's the second day. Um, and that, that's a little bit harder than, than a posture. It's, getting a, it's a little bit harder because they've got these built in um, habits of how to swim. And this one is a really hard habit to break. That's why I tell them to swim like a penguin all the time. If this is one of the habits, bad habits you have. Those people who don't do this, who don't have this bad habit, have to just hang in there with us as we get through this with all the people who do in the in the in the group, because there's going to be lots of athletes who've got this problem. So that's day two. Day three, what we work on is what I call length. And start out on the deck. And on the deck, what I have the athlete do is stand. If there's hopefully there's a wall, like there's maybe like a the uh, locker room wall or something there, as you came out in the pool, there was, there's a wall there next to it. That's perfect if you have that. Have them walk over to the wall, face it, and reach up above their head as high as they can. 
So they're in this position. Put your hand up as high as you can. And then I'd say, let's get a little bit higher. So they reach up even higher. Then I say, let's get even higher than that. So now they go up on their toes. And I say, let's get higher than that. So what they do is, what I teach them to do is, if you turn your body slightly to the side like this, you can get your hand higher. This little rotation you do with your body at the hips, get your hand even higher yet. And so I talk to them about what, why this is important. And with triathletes, most triathletes swim like tugboats, I tell them. Tugboats are wide and they have, they have no speed because they've got a lot, all kinds of drag. And that's what most triathletes swim like. They swim in this, this position where the shoulders are always in this posture. So the shoulders are always going like this. They never rotate their shoulders enough to get this posture like this, which good swimmers do. They swim in this tugboat position. Good swimmers swim like speedboats. They get as narrow and skinny as they can in the water by reaching out as far as they can with that hand. So that's the next thing I teach them is how to do that. And so we go through drills for that. There's a whole series of drills I go through. We do the same thing on the deck again with the partner. So what they're supposed to do is get in that position, reach out as far as they can. The, the uh, partner puts their hand where it should be and then helps them rotate their shoulders so they get a, a good body uh, position in the water. And that gives them even more length, just like they did when they were standing against the wall with their hand over the head. If they rotate their hand like their body like this, they get their hand even higher. So this we're trying to get the speedboat way of swimming as opposed to a tugboat way of swimming. So we spend an hour or another half hour in the pool just working on that, recording every athlete. We go through drills. One of the drills we do is uh, I call belly to the wall. So what they do, because most athletes have a hard time understanding that they've got to actually rotate their body as a little bit as they swim. It's not just like this. It's more like this as you swim. And so the belly to the wall drill is as they swim, is to take the right hand into the water, they rotate their body to their belly button, points to the left wall of the pool. So it's, a, it's an exaggerated roll. Their belly button is now facing the wall. Then their left hand goes forward, and now they want their belly button pointing to the right side, the right wall. So we go back and forth, swimming at 25, just doing that, just doing this, getting used to what it feels like to have your body do this by exaggerating the movement. I don't really want them pointing their belly buttons at the wall when they're in a, in a race, but I want them to get the feel of what this movement is like so they can begin to uh, get a sensation what your body feels like when it's rotating. So we exaggerate it, which is what you have to do sometimes to teach the skill to athletes, is exaggerate it. So we spend a half hour doing that. We record the athletes and we show them how to, how to, um, um, to do it uh, on their videos. Uh, and then we come to the fourth day. On the fourth day, we get to the, the last thing, PDL, L was length. Now we've got a C, PDLC. The C is catch. And it's amazing how athletes have been told about the catch over their entire time and that they've been swimming, but not a single one of them knows what it means. You can ask them what they're told and they say, well, reach over a barrel uh, or they, they may get some other instruction. And I tell them, what is, what is that supposed to look like on, on the deck? What do you do when you reach over the barrel? And they really don't know. That's kind of like they've got this vague idea that somehow they're supposed to reach over a barrel or whatever it was they've been told. And so I got to now work with them on a catch. And so the catch is now changes a lot of things. Now we're becoming open water swimmers. Open water swimmers don't swim the same way pool swimmers do. If you watch open water swimmers, this, this came to me once and I was watching, a, I was on, on the, um, at a race, an Ironman, and I was on the, on the uh, it was a race where the water, it was swam in a, in a canal. And so I could walk along the edge of the canal and I could watch the swimmers down below me. And so the first wave was the pros. And I watched the pros go off and I walked a ways with them. And, and the next wave came and it was age group athletes. And I watched them and it dawned on me all of a sudden that they weren't doing the same things. In fact, if you look at, if you look at the pros, open water swimmers, the pros, what you'll see is when they're when they're taking their stroke and their and their hand comes out of the water, it comes out of the water above their elbows. It does not come out of the water below their elbows. They don't have elbows high, they have hands high. That's what open water swimmers do. They have their hands high. 
look at look at the the start of a race sometime for the pros and look at the same start for amateurs and you'll see the amateurs have their elbows high the pros have their hands high that's the start of the catch is getting your hands high because what happens is we're telling athletes to become to become open to become uh, pool swimmers but they're going to swim in the ocean or they're going to swim in a lake and the water is not calm it's not a good thing to put your hand in like we've been teaching them to do we typically teach them to put their hand in relatively close to their heads and insert your hand into the water as if you're putting your arm into a sleeve or reaching into your mailbox i've been i've heard all kinds of things about how to do this and what the athlete winds up doing when they do that is something i call the death move they wind up putting their hand in a position where their hand is is above their elbow that's the position they wind up in when they stretch their arm out here like their hand is above their elbow once you've got your hand above your elbow you're you're dead in the water you're not going any place you can't go any place until you've got your hand below your elbow now you can go someplace and that's what they don't understand is that the difference between this and this when you put your hand in the water next to your head and then you reach out, what happens is your elbow drops and your hand comes up and you wind up in the death move. So we've got to get rid of that. And the way to get rid of that is learn to swim with your hand above the water instead of entering next to your head. The hand is coming above the water and the, when it hits the water, it's fingers in the water first. We're trying to get your fingers in the water first, not the palm of your hand. The fingers in and point your fingers at the bottom of the pool. When you do that, your elbow automatically comes up. And when you point at the bottom of the pool, start the stroke as soon as you get your hand in the water, you start you, you immediately have a catch. And so we work on all kinds of drills for that. And there's just a slug of drills to do because everybody has a hard time with this one. That's why it's the fourth thing that I teach because I want them to go from the easiest to the hardest. And this is by far the hardest for them to learn is how to get this catch. Once they get it, they're amazed at how fast they move through the water. So then we do drills with this. We do a drill where they swim freestyle three strokes, flip over onto their back and swim backstroke three strokes. Well, if you're going to go from front from a freestyle to a backstroke, what you've got to do is you've got to catch the water with your hand and pull your body around. Pull your body around mm -hmm. to a backstroke. You cannot pull your body around if your elbow's below your hand. You can't do it. It's impossible. So you, they have to learn. If they're going to do that, they're going to make that movement. They've got to get their hand down to grab the water and pull with it, and then they go, go to a backstroke, three strokes backstroke, and then pull your body back around again and go back to a freestyle. So we do that, we do that drill over and over and over to swim in 25s. And so, and, and video recording underwater. So we do the same thing. We're showing them what they're doing, how we can get it right. We do an on deck thing with them to begin uh, with the partners, partners showing them how to get their hand in the right position with their head. They've got their noses down so they can't see their hand. So, that's that's PDLC. And what I tell them is if you can master these four things, forget about everything else. Forget about everything else they're teaching you. Get these four things right, and you'll become a, a faster swimmer. You won't you won't get a gold medal in the Olympics, but you'll be a faster swimmer than you are right now. Hopefully, you'll get down to like 90 seconds per hundred. If we can get you down to 90 seconds per hundred, think how great that would be. So then that's that's four days. Of course, we had the first day, which was a test. Then we have the sixth day. The sixth day is we work on whatever the individual's unique weakness is of those four things. We work on that with each individual. Then we go to the last day of the camp. The last day of the camp, they've now put in more than 20 hours of training, swim, bike, and run. They're tired. Um, they can't wait to get home. They really don't want to get back in the pool again. But I have them do another 500-meter time trial. What do we think? What do we find? We find that 90% of the, of the swimmers, 90% of the triathletes improved their times just by doing 25s. And the only thing they worked on was technique and they got faster. Sometimes it's only a couple seconds. Sometimes it's 30 seconds. Sometimes it's remarkable what they change they make. But it's like 90%, 90% of them get, get improvement in their times just by doing drills on 20, 25s, never doing a single interval the entire week. Nothing hard whatsoever. In fact, they're very tired coming into this, this day. So they've got everything. All the cards are stacked against them, and yet they've, they, they swim faster. Most of them do. The ones who don't swim faster, I think, are probably because they're so tired, they just can't do it. Mm. And I suspect they'll be faster when they get home if they keep on doing this stuff. 
So then I tell them the last day, now you, you know you can get faster doing this. No more intervals. Until you can swim the goal time we've worked out for each one of them, no more intervals. Just work on your technique. Just work on those four things. Every day, when you go to the pool, especially the base period, every day when you go to the pool, all I want you to do is swim 25s. Swim at 25 and work on those of those four things. Which one is the, is the weakest for you that you need to work on? Just swim at 25, focused on that. At the end of the 25, stop on the wall, lay back on the wall, look around, see what's going on, forget about swimming for a minute. What are you going to have for supper tonight? What are you doing at work? Take as long as you want. I don't care how long. Don't time it. And then start bringing your, your focus back again to that one thing you got to work on. Swim another 25, focus on that one thing, stop at the wall, and so forth. And so do that for like a half hour. That's all I want you to do the entire base period is swim half hour swim, 25s, just working on your particular weakness of PDLC. Every day, do that. That's all you're working on. If you have a master's program you're swimming with after that, and the coach on deck tells you to do something different, reach over the barrel, uh, get your fingers together, put your fingers apart. What do they tell you to do? Say, okay, I'll do that, and then forget it. And come right back <laughs> to doing the four things I just taught you, PDLC, because that works. We just proved it works for you. So keep on working on those four things. So I'm sorry to, to overwhelm the information here, but that's what I do with swimmers in a camp is those those four things uh, that, that I was smiling all, all the way through that because uh, that, uh, first of all, I, I love that approach. I love keeping it simple because I believe a lot of coaches overcomplicate things. And I, I've read some comments on, let's say some videos I've put out on, on YouTube and I've had someone in there just give this big spiel about, well, you should be doing this, 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 this. And as a coach of I don't know, 17 years, I can't understand what they're saying. I'm thinking someone who's been in the sport for a year or two, they're not going to understand this either. So the, you know, the the best way to teach something is the simplest possible version. And I really like your approach there. And it's it's very similar to the approach that we take at our clinics. And I've tried to refine this over the last eight, eight nine years that we've run these clinics. We start with a similar thing, posture, head position, make sure you're holding your body and your head correctly. Then we go on to, we do call it alignment, just making sure you're, Know, in line with the shoulders. Uh, then we work on that rotation side to side. Um, and again, not too much either. So I see a lot of coaches telling people to rotate much more than what they need to. So I think uh, rocking side to side rather than rolling side to side, because we do. I do see a lot of swimmers, and I'm sure you do too, or triathletes, when they're going to take a breath, they'll roll to 90 degrees. They lose their balance and the legs splay and things fall apart there. Uh, so we work on rotation and then we pretty much just focus on the the catch or the, the catch and pull or whatever you might like to call it. And uh, that's it. They're like, they're the fundamental things that's going to make someone who's a two minute per hundred swimmer. They're the fundamental things that's actually going to move the needle for them. And it's when you explain it like that, it can seem it's like, no, nah, that's it's too simple. Like there needs to be more to it. But when people see themselves swimming, they go, oh my God, I can't believe I look like that. And I filmed myself three weeks ago and I looked at him and I can't believe I look like that. And I'd consider myself a pretty reasonable swimmer, but uh, you know, people can see, okay, I'm not actually doing the things that I think I'm doing. So uh, if you just can be content with sticking to the, the fundamentals and just working on your technique and not flogging yourself for the next couple of weeks, if you're around that two minute mark or a little bit quicker, you are going to be seeing results if you can just get those things right. So I'd love to hear uh, that approach because it, it gels a lot with um, what I've you know, tried to develop over the years. And I mean, I, I learned from a lot of coaches and um, try to you know, use the, use things that I find you know, helpful. And I really like the one too, about being on the wall, you know, getting that extra little bit of length where you're rotating the body, you're getting the shoulder to come up and the hips to rotate a little bit. That's a great one just to show that extra length, because when we do six, one, six drill with the six kicks on the side, take a stroke and swap, a lot of swimmers, they just, they're flat. They're not rotating at all. So it's like, yeah, all right, let's exaggerate that rotation, get you used to it, and then we'll dial it back a bit, but let's exaggerate these things to to learn it. So, uh, I mean, for me, this is this is kind of great confirmation in a way that, okay, I think we're taking a, a good approach here. Um, and you've had you know, so many years in the sport and worked with thousands of, of athletes, I'm sure. So it's great to, um, great to hear that. 
it does it does work it, it's amazing how when you make things simple um athletes get better the more complex we make things the harder it is for them to understand and and uh we don't get any place at all with things that are really complicated so i that's i kind of keep that in the back of my mind all the time when i start thinking about things i want to do with an athlete to get them to, to pr improve their performance first thing happens to me is i start going through all the details i'm starting to think about all the stuff and i have to remind myself Keep it simple. You know, keep it simple. That's what it's all about. It doesn't have to be complex. And, and the athlete will improve faster and better and become a, a, a much faster athlete if they simply learn some of the basic things and get these basic correct. Now, if I'm talking about somebody who's, who's an Olympian, different story. Mm. Now I can deal much, it's a much more complex situation now with this athlete. But this athlete's got a much better understanding of what's going on, too, and has, and has mastered a lot of things about the sport. But there's still things we need to work on with. still need to tweak things. And so consequently, it's, you know, working with an Olympic athlete is not anywhere close to working with somebody who started swimming when they were 35 years old. It's, it's an entirely different animal. So you got to treat it entirely differently. Mm. Yeah, very, very true. And one of the the... Uh, concepts that I think is very simple is the your five and two training concept. Um, could you talk a, a bit about that for those that may have not heard it before sure. and, and where that originated? Yeah, it originated with me. Almost everything I do with athletes originated with me, uh, the PDLC, for example. Um, but um, I realized that uh, I was working too hard because I was training too hard. This, this is happening now decades ago because I would get um, pretty worn out fairly quickly, fairly early in the week. And by about Thursday, you know, every week, I'm like dreading the Saturday workout because uh, I'm, I'm already you know, just dragging my, my heels as, a, as I try to run or swim or whatever I'm doing. I'm just tired all the time. And so I began to realize, you know, the problem is here, I'm just working too hard. I'm, I'm doing too many hard workouts. I need to do fewer hard workouts. That's the key. And I started reading more and more about the, the benefits of doing easy workouts. Um, and so I started shifting my, my personal training from high intensity all the time or nearly all the time to low intensity nearly all the time and, and high intensity rarely. And so what evolved from that was what I called 5-2 which is five easy days every week and two hard days every week. Um, easy days could include a day off. So if an athlete wants to take a day off, that's fine. In fact, that's, that's a good thing to do. So instead of training five days easy, we train four days easy, but certainly a day off is easy. So you get five days easy every week and two days hard. The idea is on the, the easy days that you really go easy. On a, on a uh, RPE scale, one to 10, you're doing a one or a two, you know, it's way down there. It's, it's really quite low. You're really not pushing yourself at all. But when it comes time to do one of the two hard workouts every week, now you're doing something that's more like a eight, nine, or possibly even a 10, which is not usually the sort of thing you need to be doing, but some much, much higher intensity. So we only do that twice a week. And I try to separate the two hard workouts for athletes. So if they do a, a hard workout on Tuesday, the next hard workout is going to be two or three days later. So it could be, if it's on Tuesday, it has Wednesday, Thursday, easy. Friday could be hard or Saturday could be hard. If Saturday's hard, then Friday's easy. So that's every week is five days easy, two days hard. If you do that, so you space the workouts, the hard workouts, so they're always separated by two or three days. The athlete comes into the hard workout much fresher. It becomes a higher quality workout. They get a lot more out of it. And besides that, they, we've now gotten a lot of aerobic fitness out of this too. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there now about zone two, um, the benefits of zone two for aerobic fitness. And quite honestly, that that is exactly what it is. You've got to get a lot of time in zone two to improve your aerobic endurance. Triathlon is an aerobic sport. It is not an anaerobic sport. It's an aerobic sport. You need lots and lots and lots of time aerobically. What does that mean? Well, that means basically trying to keep your, your lactate level um, uh, below uh, two. We'll get into details on all that, but keeping it easy. And if we keep that, if we keep the lactate levels low, then you're working on your aerobic system. As soon as the lactate levels start to go up, as soon as you start to accumulate lactate in your blood, 
you're no longer improving your or enhancing your um, aerobic fitness, your aerobic endurance. Now you're working on something else, but it's not aerobic endurance. Most athletes spend far too much time in zone three. If we talk about a five zone system, they're spending far too much time in zone three because they think to get more benefit out of that. And it's only slightly harder than zone two. Well, they don't really realize what they're doing. They're, they're accumulating lactate. When you accumulate lactate, it screws up the entire aerobic system. And so you don't get the benefits you would have gotten out of, out of the lower heart rate. So that's, that's basically five, two in a nutshell. It's five days easy, two days hard. And the, the thing that ties in with that same idea is that we're going to emphasize zones two and zone five. What you're doing in sport, you do a lot of zone two and a lot of zone five. Zone five improves your two max. It's the best indicator there is of your of your um, fitness. How fast you can go at VO2 max is if, if I just knew that about every athlete, if I could just get we have a, a list of athletes who are going to start the race and they can tell me what their velocity is at VO2 max, I can pretty much tell you how the race is going to turn out. Who's going to win? Who's going to be second? Who's going to be third? Right down the list. Because velocity at VO2 max or on the bike power at VO2 max is really the key to performance. And so we've got to elevate your VO2 max and that's going to drag along your, your speed along with it. And so you're going to become, you're going to start doing a lot more zone five stuff and a lot more zone two stuff and no zone three. We're only going to do zone three if the race you're doing calls for zone three, like a half iron man for a lot of athletes would be done in zone three. Well, we're going to spend a lot of time in, in the specific preparation period, getting ready for zone three. That's, that's okay. But if your race does not involve zone three, if you're doing an iron man, you're going to be in zone two. There's no reason to be doing zone three. If you're doing a sprint distance race, you're going to be in zone five. There's no reason to be doing zone three. So we narrow it down to what are you training for? And let's make sure we get the intensity right for that event that you're training for. So it's five two, five days easy, two days hard, emphasis on zone two and emphasis on zone five. That's kind of the whole concept in a nutshell. And with that sort of training, let's say zone five, are you thinking much about that in the pool with triathletes or is that more bike and run? How would you split up those sessions? It's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, but I don't start doing anything as zone five of an athlete in the pool until they've got PDLC figured out. There's no reason to go out there and go as fast as you possibly can if all you're going to do is fall apart in the pool and start making lots of bubbles around yourself and not going anyplace any faster. So that's the first thing. If they've got Once they've got PDLC under control, they've got it figured out, and they're now a master swimmer, now we can start working on, on things like high-intensity training. So now we can go back to doing intervals. Now we can do that zone five stuff, accelerations, uh, all the stuff we've got to be able to do, like when you're going around a buoy and open water swim, things you got to be able to do to come out of that buoy and accelerate again. So we can start doing things that have to do with the sport itself, the start of the race. The start of the race is always fast. If you want to be with the lead group or with any group, you got to be able to start out fast with them. So we got to work on, on zone five. But again, not until we've got PDLC mastered. Once we have that, now we can start working on the high intensity stuff. Mm. It's like trying to drive a car before it's been completed. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that's you know, right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, you get it, get it, uh, get it completed. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be, you know, some most of the way there, um, because you know not, we're not looking for perfection with technique. I don't think there's there's such a thing. But we we really want those core fundamentals in place. That's um yeah that's I, I really like that approach. And something that you've spoken a bit about uh, recently is the well the transition is people go from their forties fifties into their sixties and seventies and the the decline in in VO two max and and their capacity there. What mental advice do you have for people as they transition through that period? Because I mean even I think personally for me going from my late teens, early twenties, you're invincible, can't get injured. And then as you go into your thirties, you start to realize, okay, you're not invincible. You need to be a bit, bit smarter about your training and your approach. You need to do a bit more strength training and, and 
recovery and those sorts of things. So what sort of mental advice would you have for someone transitioning from the 40s and 50s into the 60s and 70s? Yeah, they, the, there's things that change. As you mentioned, you're, you've hit the nail on the head there. Uh, one of the most common things that changes is your VO2 max starts to decline. Um, that's been going on probably since the athlete was in their early 30s. That's been going down. And they may not have noticed it because they've gotten smarter. They've become better at training. They've become better at, at um, racing. They know the nuances of the sport. And so they they may be able to keep this hidden by the, you know, they may, they may have started losing their VO2 max at age 32, but age 37, 38, 39, they're still doing pretty, pretty well because they've figured out all this stuff about how to do this sport. They don't realize what's going on in the background, but by the time they're in their mid forties, typically they're very aware that something isn't right. And by the time they're in their fifties, it's, it's become obvious. It's like, there's no way to hide this. I do not have the VO2 max I used to have. And this keeps on going. Every decade, the athlete gets a little bit slower than they were previously. And it, it, it really is, is, is difficult to deal with for the athlete it, because it's, it, you can, we can make changes. You can stop it um, temporarily. You can stop it, slow it down. You can even reverse it temporarily, but you're never going to get it to go back the other direction um, in, in the long run. It's always going to keep on coming back down again. But the idea is to get up as high as you can for your for your age group and your and your gender. So that becomes one of the goals of training is, is to keep that high. That's where zone five comes in. Stuff, the stuff you do in zone five, the idea is to improve VO2 max. Now, the problem is, especially with running, that athletes are more likely to get injured when they're doing zone five. They push themselves too hard. Um, so if I tell, you know, if I'm talking to a group of athletes and I tell them the, the ultimate VO2 max workout is something like four times four minutes at zone five with two minute recoveries, the next day, the athletes in the, in the audience will go out and start doing, start doing their workout immediately. Four times four minutes, as hard as they can go with two minute recoveries. And what's going to happen is, especially if it's running, they're going to get injured. They're going, to, they're going to push it too hard. It's, it, you can't do it that way. You cannot start out immediately at the top. you got to start out building very slowly. So if that four by four is the ultimate workout, we're going to start with 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And every five, we're going to take a break for about three minutes and then go back and do it again. So we're going to start very, very piecemeal and bring this together with a few seconds at a time then we go to 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, go to a minute on, minute off, minute and a half, minute and a half, so forth. Then we finally get them up to four minutes on, four minutes off at zone five. But we've done that over the course of, gosh, three or four months. We just didn't start out immediately jumping on the, on the track or in the pool or on the bike and immediately start trying to do that. We kind of built up to it very slowly. Um, so they were their body adapted. And that's where athletes... That's why athletes mostly get injuries is because they don't allow their body to adapt. They push it too hard. thinking they push their limits, they'll get faster. But all they really do is they wind up putting themselves in, in danger of being injured and therefore actually slowing themselves down for a long time and starting all over again once they finally recover from the injury, whatever it may be. Mm. So that's the first thing you got to be concerned with for, for aging athletes is VO2 max. Um uh, muscle atrophy that's one thing that happens with athletes also they start becoming as they get into their 60s 70s they become lazy um, they quit lifting weights and they quit doing hill workouts they quit using paddles they quit doing things that are that that give some muscle to them give them some more more um, muscle mass and and because of that they lose the muscle it starts atrophying and once it starts atrophying, it's very difficult to turn it around. You've got to be very, very focused on doing this and something you need to be doing all the time. So that's the second thing that's very common for athletes, especially in their 60s and 70s. Not so much in their 50s, but it's, it's, just, it's going on then. They just don't realize it. The final thing is body fat. They're gaining body fat as they lose muscle mass. So their body weight may still stay about the same, but they're gaining, they're gaining fat while they're losing muscle. And so consequently, we need to do something about that. 
what research is telling us anymore is that is that aging athletes, especially 60, 70 year olds, but really all aging athletes probably should be getting more protein in their diets. And more protein means more muscle, basically, if you do something to stimulate that muscle, like lifting weights. So that's the starting point for them is doing something that increases, um, gets more, more protein in. So we can start doing things that build muscle mass, but you've also got to be doing things along the lines of that produce muscle mass, like lifting weights. Those are the big three. They all tie together. They're all related in some way. Um, and the bottom, the, the thing that ties them all together mostly is, is sleep. Um, if you get adequate sleep, by adequate, I mean at least seven hours of sleep a night. If you get adequate sleep, most of these things won't decline as rapidly as they would have otherwise. But unfortunately, as we get older, we tend to have a harder time sleeping. And so it can be, becomes more of a challenge to get, to get seven hours of sleep a night to improve your sleeping. But I even hear athletes in their 30s and 40s saying they, you know, they, they, they don't want to sleep very much. They get, try to get as little sleep as possible so they can get up and get started again the next day as fast as they can because they can sleep when they're dead. Well, you know, the good thing there is if you do that every, all the time, you're going to be dead much sooner than if you got seven hours of sleep every night. And it has, it's been connected with Alzheimer's also. Poor sleep is, is a good way to wind up with, with dementia. So when you're in your, you know, 70s or even 80s, possibly. So, you know, so sleep is kind of like the, the, the common denominator for all of these things, but most athletes, I'm afraid, don't give sleep nearly enough uh, importance in their lives. Mm. It's, it, I, I get it in in some ways where, you know, I, I, I like to get up early in the morning. I like to go training early. I like to be up before the, the sun's up because I'm, you know, I'm excited to sort of start the day. But uh, yeah, if, if I go to bed at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, it's, it's too, it's too late. And I'm going to, I'm going to feel the effects. So I, I and I, and there's that philosophy of, you know, the harder I work, the, the better, more success I'll have, uh, which is, which is true to an extent, but you've got to be smart about it. And if you're thinking long-term, that's what I really like about your, uh, I guess the, your research into this and uh, the things that you talk about is you are looking 10, 20, 30 years down the track for a lot of athletes that'll be listening to this podcast and i think the first step to uh to, to stopping it is that is that awareness this is going to happen it doesn't matter who you are when i was in my 20s i thought i looked at people in their 30s and 40s and went i can't believe you're complaining about a sore back and all these sorts of things you know you think you're going to be able to escape it but as you get a little bit older i'm in my mid 30s now uh yeah you know, i look back and think about some of the things that i thought as a teenager or 20 something and went oh my god i was so naive back then this happens to everyone but you can get a step ahead and just make sure you put some things in place and you're just consistent with the training, the strength training, and you're smart about it. And you can, you can make sure you're still at the, the top of your game at your age bracket, whatever that might be. And, but you've just got to be aware of it. First of all, are there any other things that, uh, that you look at and, or, or you, maybe you wish you knew when you were, you were younger? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much what you just said a little while ago about realizing <laughs> that things are not going to be the same when you get older. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm now what 79 years old. I've been doing this since I was uh, in junior high school, since I was gosh, you know, 12 years old. And um, so all these things have happened to me. I'm I'm very familiar with all these things from a personal account. My VO2 max has gone down. I had, first time I had my VO2 max tested was when I was 40 years old. And it was 65 uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is okay. Nothing great, but it's okay. Um, now it's like 45. So it's gone down 20 points over, what, 30, almost 40 years. So it's gone down 20 points in almost 40 years. So I'm losing about five points per decade, uh, which really isn't too bad, but I'm not happy about it. Um, so I, I, I still do, you know, my VO2 max intervals once a week to – to bring them up, to try to keep it up high. I do, a, I'm, I'm a cyclist. I do a group workout every week with a bunch of guys who could be my children. And uh, they give me a hell of a workout. And so I'm always doing things to try to keep pushing myself to be the best athlete I can be as I get older. And 
people who, who I look up to are those people who have done that already. And I know lots of them. They're all, many of them are friends of mine that have really kept, stayed active over their lifespans or now or somewhere in their 90s, even though one guy within his, who was over 100 years old was still working out every day. Uh, so those, those people are amazing and they're my role models. I try to learn from them everything I can. Mm. And uh, Joe, before we, uh, we wrap it up here, cause I appreciate, um, you know, we've been on this, uh, been on this podcast for uh, almost an hour now. Is there anything that's been capturing your curiosity lately? What's been, what's been piquing your interest there that you've been researching or thinking, ah, oh, this is, this is interesting to me. I want to find out a bit more about it. You know, one thing that always interests me is how we got here, how we came about as humans. Um, for, I don't know why that interests me, but I, I follow uh, paleoarchaeology on uh, on Twitter just so I can see what they're talking about. Um, uh, this whole idea that our ancestors, things we we're good at now or not good at now, came from our ancestors 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago. And so I, I look at this zone two, for example, we talked about a little while ago, and I look back at how how the hunter gatherers, you know, twenty thousand years ago, how they hunted. What they do? They hunted typically two days a week. They went on a run to find a deer or whatever they could find, a big animal, and they ran it down. We, we're we're the most endurance capable athletes on the planet. No other animal has the, has the endurance that we have. That's what we're good at. So a deer can, it's very, very fast, but they can't survive being chased by humans. Um, so eventually the, the, the deer just gives up, falls down, collapses, and that's the end of the deer. And now the, the hunters bring the deer back to their camp and they, they feed for two days, or maybe three, depending on how big, how big the animal is. Then they go out and they hunt again. And all this zone, all this training, they're all this running they're doing is zone two. They're not sprinting until the very end. It's all zone two. This is this nice rhythm that goes on for you know for a long, 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 long time. In some case, hours, as they're chasing an animal, trying to wear it out, and they always win. So we we're, we're still doing the same things. We're, we've evolved to work out hard twice a week, and go easy five days a week. And go when we go hard to really go hard when we go easy to really go easy but to go for a long time we've evolved to do these things over the course of i don't know how many how many thousands of years but it's, it's just part of our dna and so we're doing things now that we've learned to do but they're all very good for us and we, we if we try to beat them back by doing things differently trying to work out five days a week hard it's not going to work mm. we're not designed for that I love it. It's um, it, there's something about zone two work where it's just got this nice tempo and it's like a, a a drum beat that just sort of sits in the background. And and for me, it's a really satisfying type of training to to do where it's I I don't really find it monotonous. I just find it enjoyable once you get into the to the groove of things. And I know from my my swimming background, you had the distance swimmers and you had the the sprinters and the sprinters didn't most of them did not enjoy that zone two, that easy work. Uh, although they were very good at it because they would just go very easy, more, more zone one. They would never put in much effort at all, uh, yet could pull out a really good, good sprint. But those, uh, those endurance athletes that I, I used to train with just, just love getting stuck into a, a long set. And, uh, yeah, to me, that's, to me, that's a really enjoyable type of training. And, uh, I think it's really interesting to, to look back and just see, where does that maybe originate from or you know, how, how does it tie into to where we are today? So I think that's, that's fascinating. Uh, any, any projects, what are you working on at the moment and, and where can people um, buy your books and, and find out more about, uh, about you if they haven't come across you before? Yeah, in a nutshell, uh, I've just finished off a project, just now finishing off a two-year project called The Craft of Coaching. It's a multimedia online um, uh series of 17 modules that we put together. There are video recordings, there are roundtable discussions, there are interviews, there are articles that people or I have written on all kinds of subjects, trying to cover everything that a coach has to deal with in their coaching. Just now finishing that off, they can you can find it by just 
just by searching the internet for craft of coaching. So that that's the biggest thing I'm working on right now. And I just finished off um, revising my triathletes training Bible. The last time I wrote it was uh, 2016 and it needed to be updated. So I just finished that project off. It took me about two months to rewrite large portions of it. And that'll be coming out probably about the end of the year or the first of next year. Can I, can I ask about what you updated in it? What were some of those things that you revised? A lot of things on intensity. I, uh, I set up my intensity zone system back in 1987. And I thought, well, it's time to take a look at that again. And so I did. And I, I made a lot of changes like heart rate zones, power meter zones, so forth. So I went through a lot of things and just made, started to update, going back to the research and looking to see what we now know that I didn't know in 18, 1987. And um, so I've, I've changed all the, all the zone system that I've been using and um, tried to keep it simple, but somehow it still came out rather complex, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, in fact, I sent it to one of my friends who's a PhD in, 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 uh, in exercise science at, in, in uh, University of Stirling in, in um, Scotland. And he sat back and said, way too complicated, <laughs> which he should have said that that was a good thing to say. So I had to keep on rethinking the thing. I got it down as simple as I could, but I think it's still too complicated for him. But anyway, so that, that was the biggest thing I changed. And that then required all kinds of changes throughout the book on wherever I talked about intensity, I had to make changes on what the intensity, how you came up with that intensity. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's, it, that's a funny one, isn't it? It's just so everyone's got a different idea of it and how they would classify zone two and zone three and all these sorts of things. Like it's um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, bit murky. So the fact that uh, you've been able to feel like you've been able to keep it quite simple, I think is, is good, but it's, it's a hard one just to condense into a really, you know, simple couple of sentences or a small graph or something like that. So uh, yeah. that. My table had uh, 10 columns and 10 rows. So it was not very simple. And I think I got it down to nine columns and 10 rows. So <laughs> I didn't change it a whole lot, but I had to have all that stuff in there just to be able to explain it in the book. So I kept referring back to that one table throughout the book. So anyway, that's, that's the newest thing for me. Fantastic. Well, Joe, it's been great having you on the podcast. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and the things that you've learned over your years of coaching. And uh, some things that we've covered is the PDLC. Love, I really like that approach. So for someone going to the pool, you can think of, all right, what should I work on first? You know, I talk about it like building a house. You need to build that foundation. You got to build it in the right order. And so posture, direction, length, and catch. I really like that approach. Um, and then number of drills as well. You talked about exaggerating some changes to be able to actually see a difference in your stroke because we find people just don't do things enough to actually see any sort of difference. So I've got to exaggerate it first and you can always dial it back. Um, and you just talked about some of the, talked about five and two, two hard days, five easy, easy days. And again, it's a really simple way to think of what should I be doing with my, with my training? And uh, there is a tendency for people to over train because they want to push harder to have more success. But if you're smart about things, you can, you can go a lot further and especially the consistency of things as well, where, you know, if, if you train consistently for six months without injury, you're probably going to be a lot further ahead than if you pushed it too hard in month two and you had to sit out for a month, you're going to be further behind. So just being able to have, have that consistency and not get, get injured. So Joe, thanks again for being on the podcast and I uh, really appreciate your time.